Hey everyone! Funny story, if you go back and look at the start of all of my lives, you'll see that I do the hi everyone in every single one and it drives me crazy and I told myself this time that I wouldn't do that and I did it! Oh, so frustrating! Oh well, I do want to just say hi. <laughs> hey everyone for joining! I'll just wait for Tash to pop the little um, request sticker through. There we go. And we'll get into it. I'm excited to myth bust some of these um, conversations. Hi. Hi, how are you? <laughs> how are you? Well, thanks. So I'm just going to quickly take you off wi Travels whenever I... If I use Wi-Fi, it gets really, really jumpy. Um, I don't know if you have the same problem or not, but, yeah, I always just have to flick it off Wi-Fi and just use the 4G or whatever. It just works a little bit better. Oh, shall I do that? Yeah, give it a try. You're a little yeah. bit um, pixelated. It just get I don't know, it just gets a little bit jumpy. Yeah, that I think that's better. Yeah, you're a little bit pixelated, but I can hear you and everything now. It definitely pops in and out. We had a few similar troubles with Jamie yesterday, so I think it's just everyone's using the internet at the moment. <laughs> everyone's sort of in um, home a bit more, but it doesn't matter. But thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to have you to help. Thanks for having me. Yeah, myth bust a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, it's one of my, um, I guess, passion projects about teaching um, parents of young kids or all kids about um, how important good quality sleep is, not just the quantity of yep. sleep. And I guess that's, we'll, cover, we'll go into that today, but that's like, that's the big thing. It's about quality. Of sleep. Yeah, absolutely. Well, do you want to tell everyone who you are and what your background is um, and yeah, why this type of thing is a really big passion for you? Yeah, so I'm Tash. Um, so I'm an occupational therapist um, and I work in, I get, my business name has the word baby in it, but really it's early, about early childhood. Um, so uh, I guess I, I kind of moved into the whole sleep space um, when I had problems with my own kids and then kind of the more I read and the more I looked into it, the more... Um, I realized that it's not just a behavioral thing. And the more I learned, I was like, oh my goodness, everybody needs to know this. These poor families yeah. that are just pushing on through, trying all these behavioral strategies that just don't work because the problem's not behavioral. Um, mm. And then funnily enough that my first child was why I got into it, but then my second two were the ones which just, I don't know, serendipitously, they both had sleep disordered breathing, but I was able to identify without um yeah and advocate for them which was quite difficult um but you know we got there in the end <laughs> yeah so I, I feel understand. like that bit is a challenge because you you know sort of what you're looking for um and obviously your first point of call is to see like your gp or something that is sort of special like a great at the overall picture but sometimes yes. aren't necessarily great at those specifics you really got to sort of try and be like I'm trying to drive you down this pathway, respectfully, of course. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's it's tricky to do, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's really difficult. And, like, I, I would say I've got quite high health literacy and even going, like, when I want a referral from a GP, I, like, prep and I read and I take all these things and it can go either way. You can be like, yeah. can be like sure, here it is, or, or you end up in this kind of standoff, like, no, please give it to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, do you want, someone just said, can you ask questions? Absolutely. Send them through. Um, what we might do is I'll start asking you a couple of questions. We have a bunch that have come through um, where you can give us um, a little overview of what sleep disordered breathing is and things to look out for and absolutely ask questions as we're coming through. If it's related to what we're talking about now, we can answer it straight away yeah. but if we um have to scroll back we can do that but definitely send questions through that's not a problem at all um yeah so do you want to tell us what sleep disordered breathing is yeah so basically it's breathing that's suboptimal during sleep which affects sleep quality and the biggest yeah. um 
indicator of it um, is mouth breathing basically and it can be quiet open mouth breathing or it can be um because it exists along a spectrum so quiet open mouth yeah. breathing exists down here at the other end is your full obstruct um full-blown obstructive sleep apnea and you know somewhere yeah. in between there is the snoring and stuff like that so that you don't have to be snoring to have sleep disorder breathing it's about how the mechanism of breathing during sleep so we are, all of us um, are meant to nasal breathe. Um, a lot of us don't, uh, doesn't mean uh, it's normal. So common and normal, which I think you've touched on before, two totally yeah. different things. Very different. Um, so it's very common to mouth breathe, but it's not normal. So yeah. when we breathe through our nose, and this goes for wakefulness and sleep, when we breathe through our, through our nose, we warm the air, we filter the air, um, and the, a really important thing um, that happens in the sinus is nitrous oxide gets released. And what that does basically is promotes optimal oxygenation or gas exchange once the air gets to the lungs. So what that means is then we breathe at just the right rate. Our heart pumps at just the right rate because the blood is, uh, sorry, the um, oxygen and then the blood is optimally oxygenated. When we breathe through our mouth, what happens is we don't warm or filter the air. So those little kids that get sick a lot more often, that can be part of the piece of the puzzle because they're not filtering out those the mm. stuff in the environment. Um, and the, But the most important thing is they miss that nitric oxide. Um, so obviously the gas exchange also happens, but it's not optimised. So the Yeah, they not, compensate a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And it's not... Mm. Perceptive. Like you're not going to be panting because, you know, you're always trying to restore homeostasis. But um, it's just the heart will have to pump a little bit faster. The respiration rate won't be quite as optimal. And how this affects sleep is that your brain is pretty smart and it can figure out that something is not absolutely ideal. Um, and I guess the caseload that I see is that... Um, they just can't get into deep sleep. They can't consolidate sleep because mm. what's happening is their brain is flagging that deep sleep or that consolidated sleep as a risk. So it's like a protective right. mechanism of the body to... Um, and if you think about it, at an apnea episode, and obviously that's one end of the spectrum, but that apnea episode where they... That's literally them, their brain waking them up. You can't breathe. Wake up to breathe. Um, yeah. As I said, that's one one end of the episode, uh, spectrum, but there is that that whole along that spectrum there as well. So the yeah, pa that's... pauses in breathing are really significant. Yeah, I think that's a huge myth that I hear so often is that snoring is normal, and yeah. it's so it, it's not. Like, yes, sure, some kids can compensate and mm -hmm. they can handle it. But then there's a, that knock-on effect, isn't there? And that's yeah. where they sort of, it, what happens if your child is snoring or they're mouth breathing when they're asleep? What sort of things do we see that sort of, that sort of like build up of compensation Rumble. really? Um, so behaviour, so they'll be, so they might sleep. So some kids sleep fine in terms of uh, clock, length. <laughs> yeah, length. <laughs> Well, quantity, um, yeah. they'll sleep their 12 hours overnight, but they're mouth breathing and or snoring and they wake up, oh, what's going on there? Um, really grumpy. So behavioural. Yeah. Um, there's uh, uh, some st statistics out there about um, like ADHD and things like that, diagnosis of, there is suggestion that somewhere between 25 and 50% of kids diagnosed with ADHD actually have, sleep disorder breathing some of those obviously have a concurrent diagnosis of adhd but if you address the sleep um so that they actually get rest then even if they have a concurrent diagnosis of adhd they need to take a hell of a lot less medication and i mean what parent wouldn't want that for their child yeah um, they're just happier <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and like they still, it, and that's definitely not to say that ADHD is not a real diagnosis of that. Yeah. Really, but there can be those concurrent diagnoses, and um, certainly if you can address the physiological things that are making them not um, feel restored after sleep, then mm. why not? <laughs>
Absolutely. So what other things apart from behaviour would we see with a child with sleep disordered breathing? So the, um, the things you would notice during sleep would be positional. So um, two really common, and it's not all kids, like they all have kind of a, yeah. you know, not one of the symptoms, it's a collection. So mm-hmm. trying to open up their airway. Um, so if they're that tripod sleep where they kind of pop their bum in the air and then they're up like that and then their head back, all those babes that kind of lie and crank their head back with their mouth, open and really importantly it doesn't have to be like that like that it still can be just like yeah yeah, we're meant to have lip seals so any um open mouth can indicate that they're nasal uh, sorry that they're not nasal breathing that their mouth breathing yeah so they're trying to open up their airway restless sleep sweaty sleep um night terrors um Mm. um, kind of um what do you call it? Sleepwalking. Um, what are the, I put wrote a list so that I didn't miss anything. Uh, There's actually a brilliant blog. I'll tag it um, that oh, yeah. you wrote because I know that um, not everyone can listen with their little bubs if they're trying to settle them. But yeah. I'll tag because you've done two amazing blogs for um, uh, Sick Happens. I'll tag them because you had a really incredible it's not necessarily a checklist, but a yeah. really great list of symptoms that may not be something that's a massive red flag on its own. But when yes. you sort of like you're building up that sort of little pieces and you're like, oh, yeah, they do that and they do that and they do that. And you're like, oh, like this sounds like my child. I've had so many people after you wrote that book go, that sounds like my child. And you're like, <laughs> oh, like might be a good idea just to get your little one checked out. So what would you sort of, Um, suggest that a parent does if they think that their child might be doing that or they sit here and they're going, that is my child. (laughs) What would you do? I would get that list um, and uh, take it to your GP with the bits highlighted that apply to your child. Because, again, like we said, GPs are amazing and they cover lots of things, but they can't possibly know everything about everything. Yeah. Um, and I appreciate it's hard to advocate for your child. So I would take that list and just say, look, it's not just that they're snoring because you might get a GP that says, oh, well, they seem to be fine. They're developing, yeah. you know, they're hitting their milestones, all that kind of stuff, which is fine. But you want your child to thrive, not just get through. So I would yes. take that list through to your GP and say, and ask for a paediatric ENT um, opinion, basically. Yeah. Um, and... Also, I would, I mean, and then within the ENT community, there's obviously, um, they have their own kind of thresholds for intervention. Um, So I would also be looking for um, an ENT that is airway centric or has an interest in sleep disordered breathing. Um, Because there are um, ENTs within the community that are very much sit and wait. Um, yeah. And then there are others that are like early intervention if you want, you know, for brain development and all that kind of stuff. If you've identified it early on, let's let's treat it early on kind of thing. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, someone just said, all good if your GP can will listen. And I absolutely can understand that. I think um, finding a GP that does listen to you is really tricky. And it's so easy to sit here and say, Just keep shopping around until you find one that will listen to you because if you live in a rural setting or Mm. you don't have access to to shopping around for GPs, it's really hard. But I have done a couple of posts um, that I can share after this as well about things that you can do to help learn how to advocate for yourself. And I think this checklist is really great because if you can go in with really great high quality evidence-based information saying my child does this and this um really helps to show them what you're trying to say but also um would you recommend taking any like video footage of your child sleeping yeah, or yeah, yeah. It so was... i would film them sleeping sleep, film their position film them um with any if you can get the sound and if they're even just yeah the vault if there's any snoring or anything or certainly if they're doing any um having any breath pauses definitely yeah absolutely take some video footage of them yeah i find the video so helpful for so many different things Mm. because 
there's one thing to try and explain what you're seeing and what you're hearing and what's happening. But for a doctor or a specialist to be able to sit there and, and be able to see it, it can yeah. really help speed up that process. Cause you're like, Oh, right. Yes. I can exact, I know exactly what you're talking about now. Yeah. Um, also a symptom tracker might be really handy where you can actually write down um, how often it's happening all of those other symptoms that you're not sure are related to anything, yeah. but they're all yeah. sort of happening because it's all about building that story and trying yeah. to bring all of these pieces of information together to yeah, work and out that's what's what, happening. It's all, all the bits all together, like one of the, like another thing is teeth grinding and stand alone, yet that's not to say that you there's sleep disordered breathing, but when you pull in all the other bits and pieces, yeah. that's... Um, yeah it's about looking at it holistically yeah that's right and because there's so many times as well that um you know you as a parent might go oh i'm really worried about let's say the teeth grinding and you get so focused on that one thing that you don't realize that there's all these other things going on that might ne might not necessarily be worrying to you but mm. then if you explain all of these other things to someone else say an ENT that is a specialist in sleep disordered breathing be like oh that's textbook this mm. we can yeah, help you with it. that um yeah. but you don't know what you don't know so it's great to just get writing everything down or videoing or just tracking anything that happens because it might be really obvious to someone else that works in that field yeah. it's but it's hard as a parent isn't it to try and work it out we're not supposed to be able to yeah. work it all out well, and that's the thing and you yeah you kind of don't you don't want to over pathologize things as well so but it's just about looking at um yeah what are all the little bits that come together and yeah a symptom tracker would be a great way to to yeah yeah like all those things because you don't yeah you don't know what you don't know and yeah for sure a standalone mean, can mean nothing but altogether. yeah well someone just sent through a question saying what are some of the reasons why children have sleep disordered breathing and then what can an ENT do about it? So that's like perfect to sort of go into like what what are some causes as to why children will have problems with their sleep quality? So um, anything that is an obstruction to nasal breathing. So in the paediatric, like the young um, end of the spectrum population, the biggest um, uh, thing is generally um, big adenoids and tonsils. That's the most common. Um, so they can be um, they can be big in a um, in a normal sized airway. If your little one is just petite and their kind of facial structure is they've just inherently got small airways and they've got normal sized adenoids and tonsils and they sit in those yeah. airways, then they're too big. Um, they can. Um, so they can be congenitally large or they can, you know, have um, a, a history of chronic infection. Um, but very importantly, the whole narrative of, well, they've never had tonsillitis, their tonsils don't need removing is mm. um, not true. So there's an ENT, Dr. David McIntosh, who does a lot of parent education and he, he is obviously specialised in sleep disorder breathing and he... Um, says 80% of the adenoids and tonsils he removes are to do, none of them have had ever had an infection. So mm. you can certainly have an obstruction without a history of infection. And you can also have this kind of low-grade chronic infection that never gets to the point where um, they're sick or yeah. they have tonsillitis or they need antibiotics, but it's just r rattling away there in the back and they, they get mm. inflamed. So it's so more of an anatomical that, issue rather than it being an illness. Yeah, yeah. So if mm. your baby's just made with small airways, mm. then even though they can be normal size, it's still an obstruction. Um, so those are the big ones. Uh, allergies. So, mm. you know, cats, dogs, hay fever, anything environmental, pollen, dust, um, so if you've got in, um, your nasal passages are uh, inflamed, yeah. then you're going to have a free mouth. So if you think about when you've got a cold, it's, it's kind of like that. Well, it's exactly like that. So All the time, you, yeah. Yeah, to your mouth. Um, so they're kind of the biggest um, things with kids. So um, What about ears? Do ear infections, because I know like ear, nose and throat are all kind of connected. Is that? 
they're linked in that it's to do with um, craniofacial development, I guess. So yeah. if you've got small airway, airways, you've probably got small eustachian right. tubes. And in terms of the drainage of the eustachian tubes, um, as the face develops, um, and, you know, it's just the way congenital, the way some babes are made, the drainage is not really great. Um, yeah. So, yeah, linked in that way. So a history, if I have a child that comes through as a history of ear infection, I straight away I'm like, well, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll get it's all the information. another red flag. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, certainly they're linked in that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then obviously there's sort of that, like you were mentioning before about the sleep apnea and sort of having those really big pauses in their breathing would be a really big red flag, obviously, if your child's yes. having troubles with their breathing for anything. And I always, this is one thing that I always talk about in that your job as a parent, you don't have to have that pressure of diagnosing your child. Um, so you don't have to diagnose your child with sleep apnea or sleep disordered breathing. Like you don't have to worry about that, but looking at all of these symptoms, something like having pauses in their breathing or they're really struggling with their breathing is big enough for you to be like, well, that's, you know, that's enough. We need yeah. to go and see our GP and get that sorted. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. get some video footage if you can. Yes. Yeah. That's probably, probably going to be your most powerful um, yeah. tool because you can't deny it. When it's right in front of you. Yeah. Face. Yeah, for sure. And so then if we've gone to our GP um, and we've managed to get a referral to an ENT, what then sort of happens from their perspective? Do you... So um, so I guess the ENT, depending on the age of your child, the ENT um, can scope the adenoids because you, can, not, you can't view adenoids um, like on... Um, just in the chair yeah yeah so you can scope them so um but they kind of have to be quite little to let you stick a scope up their nose um and that'll give you a diagnosis straight away obviously you can do the throat scope have a look at the tonsils um and they'll have a look at your nasal passages so they'll look at the and kind of the symmetry and shape of your face you because you start to not you can see i guess facial patterns um, like of mixed tone and um, you know, things as simple as like dark circles under their eyes um, mm. because they're not sleeping well. They're tired. Yeah. So they might be, as I said, might be in bed for 12 hours, but if they're waking up exhausted and they look like this, you can kind of go, okay, I'm, I'm feeling like something's going on. That can also, those allergic shiners um, can indicate poor drainage of those, those sinuses as well. So again, another kind of flag which you look at. Um, yeah. Thing. Um, and then they'll look at like the symmetry of your of the child's nasal um, sinuses, the size, all that type of thing. Um, and then you know it can can be a watch and wait, or it's like they'll take a whole picture of like what what are they behaving like, what are they eating like, because mm. um, probably just going to head off on a small segue here, but no. so eating is a really big. Um, Thing, um, really important, obviously, nutritionally, but um, it's kind of like this perfect storm that can happen if they're lots of kids with big adenoids and tonsils, or just kids that can't um, nasal breathe, can be picky eaters because essentially they have to choose: am I going to chew, chew for it, yeah, and swallow, or am I going to breathe? And invariably, yeah. breathe wins <laughs> um so <laughs> that can breathing will always win so they can be d labeled fussy eaters but actually it's like oral um oral facially and oral motor skills mm. don't allow them to eat so really foods that require lots of chewing like meat um, are often rejected by kids with these kind of um, ANT issues. And then you have this kind of flow on effect. So they then yeah. become deficient in iron. And then there's this kind of whole chicken and egg thing about sleep disorder breathing. And that, iron yeah, I can first That's and, so but it interesting. This storm of... Um, yeah, it's difficult. And that's when it really feels like the wheels are starting to fall off for parents because it might have been something small and then it's another thing and another thing and you just think, 
what am I doing wrong? Like something is going on and I don't know what it is. And mm. parents feel like, like they take so much responsibility for that. And they think, what am I doing wrong? It's like, you're not doing anything wrong mm. at all. You, we just haven't gotten to the bottom of what's going on here. Um, and yeah. that's why symptom trackers and videos and things like that are really great because that's got it all there for you or for whichever health professional you want to go and see for them to be mm. able to pick out and be like, well, actually, did you know that that fussy eat or fussy eating, I should say, mm. um, yeah, they just can't chew properly because they can't breathe or they're yeah. not going to, they literally will refuse that food because they're like, I'm not going to be able to breathe when I eat that one. And yeah, it's so interesting how they all just kind of all layer come. and layer and layer. Yeah. And like I, I have, personal experience with my middle um child and I, I took a video to my gp so i know i know how hard it is i took my the video to my gp and he just said he just got to relax and i later showed it when once i got into this field to a, an amazing feeding therapist i work with refer to and she's like he has raging reflux and he can't breathe so he was starving when i'm trying to spoon feed him but he's like i know i can't breathe yeah you know it's perfect storm and thankfully we had followed that kind of that um division of responsibility approach to feeding and we're just like okay you eat when you want to but yeah. if i had been you know old school force no, you've got to eat it you have to eat like that the damage it would have done and so emotionally many, and yeah, yeah emotionally and meal times and um so now now he's fixed but <laughs> yeah that would be so yeah. stressful as well because we do put so much trust into our health professionals um but we've got to remember that they are human too and they have particular Absolutely. specialty areas so things can get missed or they don't hear you properly or maybe they're having a bad day or they're not specialized in what particular like in um pediatric ent and that's not excusing that at all mm. but it's really i just want parents to feel like you can advocate again and again and again or see someone else um don't ever feel like you if you've seen someone once and they've said it's fine that that's it that's the end yeah. of the road because you you are your child's best advocate you're their only advocate um so it's it you don't worry about being like annoying like you go and you keep mm. pushing and saying i really do need this like it's don't feel like you're being annoying because it's just this is your little one yeah yeah absolutely um yeah so, so i think i went off so what would the ent do yeah that's um, what we got up so to. sometimes it's um like if it's uh nasal stuff they might prescribe a you know a medication to help with that but that has to be prescribed by um an ent you can't just go and buy it um so that's or, to help with the swelling and the inflammation yeah yeah. yeah. Sometimes they'll say, oh, let's try that for three months, come back and see how all the other symptoms have improved and yeah. see if that is, if that is significant enough. Um, and obviously then there's removal of adenoids and tonsils. Yeah. And again, different ANTs will have different thresholds based on that whole picture. Um, some will say, well, look, the adenoids and tonsils need to go, but there's, they're under one. So let's take out the adenoids, free up some airway space, resolve it as much as we can yeah. at um, and then after they're two, let's take their tonsils out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So th I guess that's how an ENT would. Um, yeah. What about yeah. things like sleep studies? Do they help or are they sort of a little bonus they diagnosis build? Can, they can help, but then sleep is not, um, I guess, a con constant state, I guess. So, um, a sleep, what results happen on one night uh, aren't mm. necessarily of what happens on another night. And the best way, which is never going to happen with a kid, would be to do it four nights in a row and yeah. kind of average it out. It also, sleep studies can definitely miss um, the milder symptoms. Um, yes. Or They're they looking might for those really them. severe breath holding yeah. episodes. Yeah. 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 And it can... And it can also label um, uh, sleep disorder breathing as mild or moderate or uh, give a false negative. Yeah. And actually the impact on the child is not mild or moderate. It's significant. So, yeah, yeah I mean, they have a place. And I think like um, in the US and stuff, 
for insurances because it's all complicated. They have to have sleep studies before yeah. you can do intervention. But luckily here um, we can have a bit more of a holistic approach and go, look, yeah. let's look at symptoms rather than just that one. Because I feel like it's, yeah. it's one one way of looking at it, but it doesn't necessarily um, capture everything. Yeah, and it's it kind yeah. of like a skin prick test where it gives you one piece of information, but it doesn't necessarily indicate whether they're going to have an allergy or not. So it's like it's one yes. piece of information, but it doesn't necessarily always reflect on the, the impact that their sleep is having on their general well-being. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That is so interesting. I'm just going to quickly check. I'm pretty sure you've actually covered all of the questions um, that we got through. What about is it age-wise? Is, is it something that you would find more from birth or do the symptoms kind of get more pronounced the older that they get? Like is it more common in toddlers or how does that uh, sort of work? It can exist. From birth, but I guess the, I mean, and because there's other causes which um, uh, I haven't gone into, but it, it would depend on the cause of it. So those, the ones yeah. I've covered are the kind of most common, but, you know, there's things like yeah. ring on the left and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the, if, if, if you've just got big tonsils and adenoids, it's, they're going to be big from birth. Um, and then, but if it's uh, something to do with an allergy that will develop yeah. and it might, you know, it's things like, um, like if you have a look through the literature, you'll see things like this, um, oh, there's one really good image of this, um, young guy developing like his face is all symmetrical and lovely. And then, and his family get a dog that he's allergic to. And then within the, oh. you see his chat, he's obviously allergic to it and you see his whole, cause they, they develop this kind of posture thing like this, cause they're trying to open up their airway so they shoulders slump like this is long term yeah and the whole safety structure changes so it can happen at any point um uh, because yeah. it depends on what the um frequency of it now the adenoids i think by about 18 we don't have them anymore um so but tonsils obviously still are there unless they get removed um <laughs> uh so and, you know, some people in do say, well, you will outgrow your adenoids and tonsils in terms of you'll grow around them. Yeah. But my perspective is, yeah, that might happen, also might not, but also the, all that growing and facial development that happens in that time and just that it's like having rubbish, crappy sleep for yeah. six years you know in those really formative years where all that brain development's happening so um yeah, yeah i guess it, that's where i would say i would i would always go for the early intervention yeah absolutely because otherwise your little one is just in a constant state of trying of working harder um hmm. and yeah they can just like you said it can impact behavior and their physical um development as well as their brain development like every those early years are so critical and once they're sort of hitting into preschool and school and everything sort of gets bigger and more complicated and it's exciting you want to give them that best opportunity um yeah, that you possibly can so i think that's yeah i think i i would agree with you i'd be like yeah as early as you can get onto it the better but often um you don't realise that anything is happening until those symptoms have gotten worse. And it might be at sort of that age three, age four, where it's like, what is going on? Mm, yeah. Mm. And, or you get to kind of that that breaking point of like, okay, I'm done. I can't, I, can't, I can't deal with this rubbish sleep anymore. I've done it for three years. What's going on kind of thing. Absolutely. And I think um, a lot of the questions that came through were about sort of, parental anxiety um where you know that there's something going on um but you can't quite pinpoint or perhaps you have gone to see your gp and it's been like it's fine it's fine it's fine you're like no really there's something going on um i guess you can always contact private rooms like private ents um directly it's just more expensive and i know financially not everyone can can just do that so that can be really um 
challenging. And the wait lists are always really long. Have you noticed that sometimes it's like, okay, we can try and get in to see someone, but it's going to be six months, 12 months. Like it's going to be a really long yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, particularly, and COVID's just made it even yeah. worse when elective surgery stopped. But, um, yeah, certainly there's wait lists and they obviously triage. So, you know, the, kid, the yeah. kiddies that are, uh, have the more severe stuff will be seen first. But, again, I think, yeah, just go on that wait list and, and like, and, like – I, I, I know you sit there and like, oh, I can see all this stuff happening and I, I can't do anything about it. But, I mean, the, and uh, I'm in the same boat with one of my kids. She's not old enough or big enough yet to have the next set of sur the next surgery that we need. Yeah. And I, I have huge anxiety about it. I'm like, oh, my God, I know all this stuff that's happening and she's not breathing. Mm. She's um, but, yeah, all I can do, all I can do is wait. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which but, is so, really yeah, frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, super frustrating. Yeah, for sure. Oh, well, I'm so appreciative of your knowledge sharing. I think um, people watching it back will probably have more questions. I'll tag your um, page, our, the blogs that you've written, um, and you're happy to answer any questions if people are popping them in um, yeah, after yeah. I save this as an IGTV. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. Awesome. I'm yeah. so thankful for your time. Just, and I'll just quickly do, I don't think there was more questions. No, I think that was all of them. But thank you so much again. Um, I okay. really am so thankful and um, hope you have a really great rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Bye. Bye.